thank you again and welcome to our virtual forum for residents of Guilford and Madison and really for anyone interested in how long term sea level rise is affecting coastal communities. Uh, this webinar is brought to you by a great group of folks at Audubon, Connecticut, the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, the Connecticut Audubon Society and Monunkatuck Audubon Society and today's presenter is Dave Kozak from DEP. So today's forum is meant to help you understand how you as a local landowner can help address the issue of long term sea level rise, which is impacting our local communities. Um, as an important marsh stakeholder, potentially, we hope you will leave today's forum with next steps and a plan to work with us to sustain the marsh into the future. Um, we are recording this forum so you can access it after the fact and um, we uh, and also sorry if you um, don't want to be seen on camera at any point that's fine just keep your keep your video off you can still ask questions in the chat box or you can unmute yourself to ask questions when the time arises. Um, so we will also have time at the end for discussion. We hope you'll stick with us and we look forward to speaking to you, learning more about your interests and uh, where you live. And I'll pass it on to David to begin the presentation. Thanks. Good evening all. Thanks for sharing your Wednesday evening with me and my colleagues from the Audubons. I have worked with the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection's Coastal Management Program for 29 years, um, principally assisting municipal coastal municipalities review development proposals, acquire land for coastal land conservation, and managing flood hazards, um, as well as taking a, a look at how sea level rise may be affecting our saltwater and brackish water marshes. Um, today, we're gonna to focus on the East River Marsh in, in Guilford and in, in Madison. Um, last time I, I, I worked in the in the communities, we were able to assist the town in acquiring the East River Preserve at the very head of the, of the marsh. The marsh is uh, over, over 900 acres um, and it's one of the largest high marsh dominated uh, coastal marsh systems in, in southern New England. Um, it's been around for between three and 5,000 years and over the last century or so, it's pretty much been able to keep up with Sea level rise. Um, these marshes outlined here, the head at the head of the of the East River Marsh, uh, only can survive at a delicate balance between between being flooded frequently enough to support the types of plants that define a marsh and dry enough um, in order to be able to exist. They are they are they're not underwater plants. They are they are um, intertidal plants. It means they're subject to the ebb and flood of the tide. There's a drying period and, and a wetting period. Sea level rise is one of the more recently recognized threats to our marshes. There are others, um, in, including uh, filling and other kinds of disturbances, which we've addressed through legislation uh, and regulatory programs. Um, invasive species have invaded our marshes. We've changed the hydrology of our marshes, including modifying them with salt, with, uh, with mosquito ditches, which has changed the hydrology and the ecology of the marsh. What we're gonna focus on today though, is the effect of this more recently recognized threat of changing more accurately, increasing levels of sea level rise and how it's going to affect, affect the marsh. Um, if the rate of sea level rise increases beyond the rate that the surface of the marsh can increase to keep up with that increase in sea level rise, it'll drown. Um, it'll also respond by trying to move upland or inland to try to sustain itself. So those are, those are two ways we can try to think about the challenge that we're gonna talk about a little bit more. There are threats within the existing footprint um, that may or may not happen depending upon whether that elevation of the marsh can keep up with increasing rates of water levels in Long Island Sound and how we manage the upland surrounding the upland edges of the marsh to allow the marsh to migrate inland to survive. Now to do this we need the cooperation of the landowners who own these areas at the upland edge of the marsh. We're calling those areas where the marsh moves out of its existing footprint onto the currently dry upland that becomes increasingly wet with sea level rise 
marsh migration areas. And we're gonna need the cooperation of the owners of these areas to ensure that they remain undeveloped for the marsh to expand its existing footprint where marsh grasses can continue to survive on what is now dry upland, but will become wetter and able to accommodate marsh vegetation in the future. What we don't want to happen is that land that is identified as capable of supporting marsh in the future to change to a, a, a land cover type such as housing or any kind of pavement that would preclude the marsh from being able to move into those upland areas where it would otherwise be suitable for moving upland and inland. Let's go over a little bit more detail what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about why these marshes are important, where they are, and, and what they are. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about what the East River Marsh looked like in the past, about 100 years ago or so, some pretty cool uh, historic mapping that we have and aerial imagery, and what they look like now, what the marsh looks like now. How coastal marshes in general respond to sea level rise? What's the, what's the mechanism? What are the ecological mechanisms uh, that marshes use to try to adapt to, to sea level rise? And then we're going to look uh, more particularly at the East River Marsh and its projected response to sea level rise using a computer mapping uh, program called Sea Level Affecting Marshes Model, or SLAM, that's been used throughout the country um, in just about uh, every coastal state in the country to try to anticipate how marshes will change. And then lastly, we'll talk about what will be the landowner response to this change. How will you as land, coastal landowners, landowners along the edges of the marsh, how will you be affected by increases in sea level rise? And how will you be affected by your changing backyard, which may become uh, flooded more frequently and perhaps become marsh? First of all, always good to start with a definition. What are these coastal marshes? So these coastal marshes are transition areas between low energy water bodies, such as this river in the background, we can consider that, for example, the East River, not subject to lots of wind and waves or strong currents. It's a low energy uh, coastal environment and uplands here defined by this, by this tree line. So in between these low energy coastal water bodies is this transition and the upland is this, transi is this transition zone where coastal waters come and flood up over the banks of the, of the river and flood the marsh and then recede and they leave salts in the soil. And it's this process of wetting and drying and the deposition of salts in the soil that form a salt marsh. It's generally defined as an area of low marsh with these grasses here called the smooth corn water grass right along the edges of the rivers and the tidal creeks. Way up on the other side is the upland area or the marsh border, usually defined by a five or six different types of shrubs. But in the middle is this large open plain called the high marsh, which is infrequently flooded. We'll talk about this a little bit more in a, using a graphic that uh, was prepared uh, uh, by Patrick Lynch in a great book called A Field Guide to Long Island Sound. Let's take a look at this blue dashed line here closest to the water. This marks the upland extent of the low marsh or the frequently flooded marsh that's flooded twice a day uh, during the high tides. The water comes up out of embayments or up out of rivers and comes and pretty much comes to this mark called the mean high water mark. And it supports uh, a low variety of plants, principally the salt water core grass. As we move upland in the landscape up towards the, the, the upland area, we have that high salt marsh plain, this the largest part of the marsh. And within this marsh, there are small depressions, such as this, lower elevations of the high marsh where salts collect and the soil is such that there's very sparse vegetation in these areas. There are also pools that have constant standing water. Also in this high marsh are creeks which pass through the marsh. And perhaps you've seen this if you took a look at the very nice video that was produced uh, for this program that was included in the invitation. Uh, these marsh creeks run throughout the high marsh and they are bordered, again, noted by this dashed blue line, by these tall grasses called the saltwater core grass. A few grasses on the high marsh dominate, such as the black grass, the salt meadow cord grass, um, a few other grasses. 
And then the last part of the salt marsh or the coastal marsh is this marsh border. And this is also a narrow area, much like the, the low marsh. And this narrow band includes a variety of plants such as switchgrass, beach plum, bayberry, the groundsel tree, um, the high tide bush or, or marsh elder. And these are often woody plants interspersed perhaps sometimes with cedar trees and then the uh, upland area of the, uh, of the forest in this picture, sometimes bordered also by, by upland lawn. These creeks are important because they support a variety of, uh, of, of life that uh, many of us are familiar with. Um, so what we want to do is try to make sure that only those uses that are consistent with sustaining these plant vegetations and these, and these animals that use the, the waters of the marsh are, are not harmed. And we do that, we do probably that protection by regulating these uh, coastal marsh areas but using the Connecticut Tidal Wetlands Act through the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection's coastal permit programs. Now, where local landowners come into play as far as their marsh management decisions and the effect on the fate of the marshes in the future with sea level rise is this upland area comprising the upper part of the marsh border, this shrubby area, and the, um, the area here of, of woodland, and sometimes it's, it's open fields or, or lawns, where marsh currently doesn't exist, but with increases in the rate of sea level rise, will become wetter and wetter and transition to marsh. But it will only be able to transition to marsh within these marsh migration areas if that land is kept in a condition that can accommodate that type of change in, in plant community. It won't happen if there are buildings on it or blacktop, and that's what the target is uh, that I want to talk to you more, more about today. So how are we going to do this? Well, we've, we've used these programs, for example, the sea level affecting marshes model, to try to identify those marsh migration areas with the greatest conservation value. Where are the larger ones? Where are those um, properties um, that are most likely to support marsh in the future? We've got to understand what the target is. We also need to understand what the owners are, uh, landowners uh, plans are for their properties and what their concerns are about managing their marsh front, managing their property that could increasingly be flooded, um, certainly during uh, coastal storms um, and during regular tidal events with sea level rise. And then we need to work with those landowners to develop marsh management or conservation strategies. Um, how can we help you manage your land so that you can enjoy your marsh front property without harming it? And can we come to some kind of uh, agreement to ensure that your land will, will remain in a state that can accommodate the future migration of these marshes in the future, even after you no longer own it? These marshes principally occur within embayments or embayments are these little recesses or indentation in the shoreline. For example, here's New Haven Harbor, that's an embayment. The arrow here points to Guilford Harbor, the mouth of the Connecticut River here, uh, Niantic Bay here, Thames River here. These embayments are lower energy environments where our major tidal marshes uh, occur because they're low energy. Um, we also have very little sediment in our waters in Long Island Sound, which is another important ingredient to, to creating marshes. Our coastline is a bedrock dominated system such that there isn't a lot of new sediment being generated by wind and wave action that hits the coast because it is such a hard shoreline. So the sediment that's important for, for feeding these marshes, they can keep up with sea level rise. There's not a lot of new supply of that sediment being delivered. The sediment generally washes in and out along the shorelines. These marshes exist within these valleys defined by ridges shown here in the dash red line. And usually within these valleys, we have glacial meltwater deltas. It's on top of those sand and gravel deposits that were placed here during these glacial meltwater deposits uh, on which most of our larger marshes exist, shown here in, in yellow. Let's take a look at that from an aerial perspective. Same place. Here are those ridge lines. And between those ridge lines are these valleys where marshes like the East River Marsh reside. So in, as you start to move up and in inland in these valleys, the, the, the slopes of the uh, adjacent lands often increase, making it difficult for the marshes to move upland because of those steep slopes. So that's something that we need to concern ourselves with as well, because it's going to be more difficult for marshes to migrate 
when you get further up these valleys and the landscape starts to be a steeper slope along the edges of the, of the marsh. So let's take a little tour of what the marsh looks like. We do that through a series of photographs. Let's start way down here at the uh, Guilford Marina at, at the harbor, kind of the, the, the mouth of, the, of, of, this, of this valley. Here we have a broad plain um, occupied by this high marsh with some creeks. This is Sluice Creek cutting through. Um, here's the East River. Here's Grass Island, uh, the boat launch. And you have these broad plains often at the mouth of these valleys uh, where these marshes sit. And then as you move inland, for example, here north of the Amtrak and south of Route 1, we see, start to see a change in the marsh landscape. You can now see the constriction of the valley. Here's the east side of the valley, and here's the, north, the west side of the valley with more ridgeline. And you've got a much narrower uh, uh, plain within your or, or marsh platform here. And you're also starting to see changes in the vegetation as a result of some of the um, um, some of, some of the crossings of these valleys uh, used by railroads um, and roads and tide gates, such as the tide gate down at the, at, the, at, the, at the Guilford Marina, which is restricting the flushing of this marsh, changing the type of vegetation from um, the more natural vegetation we'd expect to see in a marsh to more invasive plants, such as this common reed or Phragmanes estrellas. We'll continue to go up all the way up to the head of uh, the East River um, at the East River Preserve. Um, and here again, you'll see the steep banks of the, uh, of, of the valley and fewer opportunities for, for the marsh to move inland and upland. So we'll take another look uh, at, the, uh, at this uh, marsh. Um, you can see up here um, the, the general um, direction of the camera shown in this red cone. So the direction of this red cone here is gonna show you where this picture is, is taken. It was taken from a drone and we're gonna do a, a scanning uh, of the marsh by going along with the, uh, with, the, with the camera. Okay, so here we see the Amtrak rail line, the East River, Here we start to see some of the complexity of the, of the marsh landscape. The marsh does not exist in isolation. It is surrounded often by, by roads, uh, by homes. Um, uh, there are islands in the marsh, such as here, a little bit higher elevation. These areas would likely be marsh migration areas as well. Um, they're also currently important for, variety, for a variety of birds that, that use the marsh. Here is Garnet Road um, in Madison. Many of you know it. Uh, those who do live there know that it floods from time to time. Um, and this is another, uh, another issue that we're gonna have to deal with because as we manage these roadways, perhaps elevate them to make them more resilient or resistant to flooding, we're gonna be affecting our marshes. There are often culverts that go under these roads. For example, you can see here Creek, the Creek goes under the road and there's a culvert here that joins it to the other part of the marsh. And as we reconstruct these roads, we'll have opportunities to change the flushing of these areas that are inland of the road um, and managing such that bringing more salt water into these areas to restore some of these areas of the marsh that have been harmed when these roads were, when these roads were constructed. So we'll continue to zoom around, we're looking north now. then out towards the sound. And again, a nice picture of the complexity of these marshes surrounded by the sound, homes along the beach fronts, uh, a variety of upland areas with it within the marsh, showing you a little bit about the complexity of, of, of the marsh. Okay, so why should we care about these marshes? What do they do for us? And what do they do for um, some of the uh, plants and animals that depend upon them? Here's a description of the food web for Long Island Sound. We all recognize many of our iconic uh, uh, animals of the sound, such as the seals, uh, 
striped bass and bluefish and, and various types of waterfowl and, and, and other birds that we're very familiar with in the sound. But here at the, at the base of this food web um, is what we're calling the detritus. It, it's organic matter that has been shredded and decomposed into small pieces uh, by a variety of, uh, of, of, of decom decomp uh, decomposers, um, various types of uh, zooplankton, for example, um, and others that are providing the basis of the food web. And it's these coastal marsh grasses, these coast various plants within the marsh, break down into these little pieces of detritus that support all these higher uh, levels of, 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 of energy and, and, uh, and uh, animals that, that rely on this soupy mix of detritus that is exported out of the marsh in the creeks and the rivers out into the sound so that we can enjoy a variety of things that we all know a little bit more about perhaps, such as the salt marsh sparrow, um, which nests in the marsh, glossy ibis that, that use it for loafing and for feeding, um, shellfish that depend upon clean water um, that's provided by the marsh. The marsh is a great uh, filter of, of pollutants. Um, and because of these services, what we call ecological services that the marsh provides, we get to enjoy the sound in a variety of ways, whether it's through boating, uh, fishing, uh, kayaking. Um, and these are all reasons why we want to make sure that we have a healthy marsh system. There are other important ecosystem services that are provided by the marsh as well, such as flood and erosion control. These marshes are the first line of defense. When a storm comes in, the wave energy is absorbed first by these marshes before it hits uplands that are often built upon um, that would be threatened by, by these storms if they didn't have these first line of defense. And it only takes as little as 30 to 40 feet of, of marsh along a coast to significantly reduce the wave uh, energy that's delivered to, delivered to the coast. These marshes also are like big sponges that absorb uh, coastal waters during, during flooding and then slowly release them after the storm recedes. And without that type of uh, flooding attenuation or mitigation, you would have more uh, flooding in our, in our coastal communities. Again, they're kind of like big sponges in, in, in your backyards that are soaking up this, these uh, flood waters and slowly releasing them. But in some areas, we have not wisely chose how to build along our marshes. Um, and we are seeing flooding out of these marshes into areas of a community that perhaps would have been better off if they were less densely developed or developed in a way that would allow the marsh to expand. Uh, for example, here's a, here's a road along uh, the, the, not the East River Marsh, but the Wheeler Marsh in Milford, um, where road flooding is more frequently occurring and municipality is coming to DEP to um, elevate their roads in response to this kind of, this kind of flooding. But if these marshes didn't exist, or they disappear and they can't sustain themselves in the long term, um, this type of flooding will likely increase. So another important, but sometimes not mentioned, value of these marshes are they're incredibly uh, important aesthetics, uh, aesthetically to, to, our, to our community and help define the aesthetics of our, of our community. Um, and I'd kind of be interested here at this point to hearing from you. Which of these ecosystem services, or perhaps others I didn't mention, uh, are, 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 are important to you? Would, you? would you care to talk about why you decided to give up your, your evening tonight um, and talk about the East River Marsh and how, what's your relationship to it? How, how, do you, how do you benefit from some of these ecosystem services? Anyone want to chime in? Can we, un can we uh, share and unmute those who, who might want to raise their hand? If folks have a question, you can unmute yourself or I can unmute you at this point, or you can type it into the chat box. Or sorry, not a question, but an answer to David's question. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> I know I'm kind of dark here, but um, I, uh, think the the thing that attracted me the most to to this talk was not the science but the undeniable beauty of the marshes uh, we're in Indian Cove and lucky enough to be surrounded by marsh and reminded every day that if it were not for those marshes on the coast that we'd be a suburb 
we'd have houses all around us. And the marshes are kind of a breathing space for our community, as well as a, a, a wonderful site where the colors change with every new season. They really are beautiful. Like you say, every every season, the marsh grasses are slightly different colors, slightly different in early summer than late summer, fall and, and, and spring. So yes, I, I think it's something we don't often mention. We, we talk about sometimes the harder, quote unquote, the uh, more definable marsh ecosystem services, such as flood control and erosion control, but just the beauty of these marshes, I think are incredibly important to the, the, the character of, of coastal communities. Does anyone else want to chime in or should, or should we continue? We had a question in the chat um, from Julie. Are marshes much of a carbon sink? Yes, they are a carbon sink. And our University of Connecticut is trying to evaluate how that carbon sink and how, how they process um, other nutrients, especially nitrogen, which excessive loads of nitrogen to Long Island Sound and some of the embayments can seriously affect in a negative way of water quality. And so the University of Connecticut um, biologists are studying how these marshes absorb carbon, nitrogen, and, and, and other nutrients and how they how that, that ecosystem service change of nutrient, what they call nutrient sequestration or absorption, how that will change with changes in the marsh. If the marsh changes to a different type of vegetation, how will that carbon and nitrogen attenuation storage, um, how will that change? So it's going to be interesting to see some of the results uh, of this. But yes, um, they are, they do capture carbon and, and, other, and other nutrients. And with that, I'm going, to, I'm going to continue on. We can come back, but I just, want to, I just want to get some thoughts as to why people bothered to show up tonight and why, the, why the East River Marsh was, was important to you. So let's take a look at the river, uh, at the at the marsh. What it looked like in the past, what it looks like now. Look at these guys. Uh, this is the 1930s era Work Progress Administration ditch diggers who, uh, throughout the coast of Connecticut and, and other parts of southern New England, especially during the 30s, were digging salt marsh, were di digging ditches in salt marshes for mosquito control. Although these, these guys were preceded by you know, at least 100 years by colonial farmers who farmed these. Uh, these marshes for salt hay. So as early as the 1700s and early 1800s, uh, we know that um, farmers were trying to manage the hydrology of these marshes uh, to dry them out so that they could more readily harvest salt hay. But it was really in the 1930s when um, the salt marsh ditching really took off in earnest. And, and, and there's estimates that between 80 and 90 percent of all Connecticut's coastal marshes have these have these ditches in, have these ditches in them. So here's what the marsh looked like in 1880. So in the upper right hand corner, giving you a little bit of context. You now here's where the larger picture is: um, Amtrak Railway, South Union Street. Here's Leeds School over here, Route 146 Boston Road intersecting with Route One. And this is what the landscape looked like in the 1880s. This was based upon the uh, National Coast and Geodetic Survey, which did very detailed mapping as back as, as early as the mid 1800s through the uh, mid 1900s. And we're lucky enough to be able to have these, uh, these maps um, and photographs that I'll show you a little bit later what the marsh looked like and how it's changed. The only real development we see here, here's some structures along the Bo uh, Boston Road 146, which is just a few here. Uh, the rest shown in this green outline is the marsh boundary. So everything in green uh, is marsh. Uh, this stippled area is either cultivated land um, or, or forest. But again, a, a pretty naturalistic landscape in the 1880s. Um, one thing that's missing from here that you will see now as we go into the 1930s, the same, same, same place. Again, here's some little bit of context. South Union Street, here's Socket Road, if you know that. Soundview, here's the rail, rail Amtrak rail line, Route 1, 146. Here are these mosquito ditches stop popping up uh, in kind of this grid-like pattern. Um, and that was a significant change um, in the early 1900s to, to Connecticut salt marshes. And we're still trying to figure out how to manage the effects of those, of those salt marsh ditches. And as early as the, uh, this period, we saw some filling of the marsh. These red circles show areas that were formerly marsh, 
This was the, the, the Moore boundary again uh, that I showed you from the 1880s. Um, and now this has disappeared. The area over here has also disappeared um, uh, from, to, from uh, marsh to, to non-marsh. Now let's zoom ahead to current day. Again, a little bit of perspective as to where we are, this larger photograph. Um, and the blue stipple shows the existing outline of the East River Marsh. Again, with some of contact to show you where, where you are. And now if we uh, identify, if we were to compare the outline of the marsh for this part of the East River Marsh between Amtrak and, and Route 1 from the 1880s, all of these areas shown in circles are areas that were marsh in the 1880s, but no longer, no longer marsh. So there has been significant filling, dredging, and, and draining um, in construction of all kinds of infrastructure throughout the marshscape that's significantly affecting the health of the marsh. And it's been demonstrated that those marshes that have been beat up in this kind of way are likely going to be less resilient to, to sea level rise. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in the future. So how do these, how do these mar how do marshes in general respond to, to sea level rise? Think of, think of it this way. These marshes are kind of in a race with Long Island Sound. Long Island Sound wants to drown them out. And, and Long Island's water levels in Long Island Sound have been rising for centuries. And they are rising and trying to overtake the marsh and turn it into open water. The marsh is responding in a couple of ways to prevent that from happening. It's trapping more sediment as the water comes and floods onto the marsh during, during the high tides. It traps sediment and starts to build the elevation of the marsh. Some of the plant growth then dies. Uh, the detritus of that, uh, of that, uh, of that uh, plant material starts to build the elevation of the marsh. So all kinds of biogeochemical reactions going on um, in the soils that are also um, changing the elevation of the marsh. So it's this competition between the marsh trying to rise to meet the re uh, rising sea level. And as long as these two are kind of in equilibrium, and they have been for the past century or so that we know of, uh, in this area between two and four millimeters a year of sea level rise is pretty much matched in a natural marsh that have not been affected by, uh, by man, that the accretion of the of the of the sediments and the and the organic matter and the building up of the, of the elevation based upon what's going on subsurface, it's been able to match that sea level rise of between two and four millimeters a, a year. But with increasing rates of sea level rise, the prediction is that the marsh may not be able to keep up with the increased rates of sea level rise. So that's one way that a marsh tries to respond to increasing water levels in Long Island Sound, building its marsh elevation. Another way is it tries to move inland and upland. So for example, here is a sea level in the past and marshes growing in this intertidal area that are regularly flooded by the ebb and flood and the tide. Now with current sea level, this marsh is gone. This is all now marsh peat down here where the former marsh existed. But this is a nice gentle slope and it's undeveloped and it has the types of soils that are well suited for marsh to move inland and upland and that's what's happening. And that's what we expect to continue to happen in the future as sea level rise continues in those areas where there's enough sediment in the water to build up this elevation. We have a nice gentle slope and we don't have development blocking the marsh. As long as this can, this can happen, this is a second way that marshes can try to keep up with sea level rise, moving laterally and inland to try to expand their footprint. But, and there's a big but, in parts of the country, especially in, in, uh, in New England, where we have steep terrain along parts of our marshes, the marsh cannot move up the slope. We don't see marshes on hillsides, right? We see them on broad plains. So we have to have that gentle slope um, along the edges of the existing marsh. If we have an abrupt slope such as this, the marsh drowns. Now, in some areas, we have that nice gentle slope upland of the existing upland boundary of the marsh, but the marsh can't move inland because it's being blocked by some type of structure usually. And it results in a net marsh loss. And this is what we were concerned about. We wanna make sure that if there are these areas that are available to accommodate the upland migration of the marsh, this does not happen if we, if we value our marshes. And there are 
barriers to, to salt marsh migration. Um, people want to try to protect their upland, um, and they do that in a, in a variety of fashions. So here's some pools of water, likely from a, a extreme high tide, perhaps the storm. And here's one type of response um, to that inland or upland movement of marsh uh, is to try to fortify it. Um, and if this were to occur, we're not going to be able to allow this marsh to naturally move inland or upland like it, like it wants to. So I'm going to again stop here for a second. Now I've talked a little bit about changes over the marsh from the 1830s up to current day. How about you, or even maybe more recently, for those of you who are lucky to live along the marsh, maybe for you know, 10, 20, 30 years or more, might be on the call. Have you observed any changes in, in the marsh in your backyard or perhaps in other parts of town that you regularly visited with marshes? I'm curious. Um, I live on Long Cove, which is just adjacent to Indian Cove. Okay. And we've lived here for 30 years and we've watched the marsh change from what looked like a whole, like a, a wheat field to what is now an absolutely beautiful marsh with the open areas and the, everything, <clears throat> excuse me, that you've been describing. Mm -hmm. um, if you go uh, along Route 146 near the entrance to Westwoods there in Sam Hill, mm -hmm. you can see the very top of Long Cove which is the very degraded section of the marsh. If you ever want to see a comparison, what a, what a healthy marsh would look like versus what a very degraded marsh looks like, there's a little patch of land across from the Sam Hill entrance that was, is part of Long Cove, but is cut off by Route 146. Mm -hmm. I have heard of similar stories th throughout the coast, especially where, where roadways cross these marshes. There's speculation that these narrowings in the, uh, uh, when causeways or roads were built over some of these marshes, they may have restricted the, the amount of sediment that can be delivered into the marsh, placed on the marsh surface, and that's changing the elevation of the marsh surface relative to the, the water levels. Um, and oh. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. I was going to say what happened with Long Cove was that there was an active state of Connecticut effort back in 1986 to restore the marsh. And the way in which they did it was they opened a culvert that had only been draining the marsh for years and years instead of allowing the water to marsh to wash in with each tidal um, flush. And right. so with the, the, that culvert being opened, that allowed the marsh to ultimately change. And we in the, in the agency are, are still working on those types of modifications to the hydrology of the marsh to make sure that there, we can deliver the, the water and the sediment into the marsh and just as importantly drain the marsh at, at low tide. If those culverts are raised too high and they can't drain the water well enough out of the marsh, the standing water on the marsh continues to, to, to degrade the marsh. Anyone else want to ch uh, share any uh, insights and what they've seen um, in, in marshes they might live next to over the past couple decades. All right, well, th th thanks for sharing that. So uh, one thing I, I, I've noticed is that there's a lot of dead zones at the edges of marshes. I think um, some of that may be a temporary effect because of the metonic cycles, because uh, over the past decade or so there, there's been um, higher tidal cycles because of the, loon, uh, because of the lunar uh, um, configurations. Uh, but I've, I've been noticing a lot of marsh dieback at the edges of marshes uh, all around, around Connecticut. And I'm, ho I'm hoping it has to do with the metonic cycles. And the other thing is I'm noticing that the salt marsh sparrow is much harder to find even in places where marshes appear healthy, especially in the East River Marsh. Hmm. Interesting. Well, to try to um, project how these marshes might respond to increasing rates of, of sea level, we have applied the sea level affecting marshes model or SLAM model to Connecticut's coast uh, for all of our marshes. Um, and we have now focused on the East River Marsh. And I want to take a show you what some of the results of that modeling uh, are, are for this marsh. But first, we need to understand what some of the uh, what goes, into, what goes into this model. So the model actually used five different sea level rise scenarios, two of which I'm showing you here. 
at the bottom of the uh, of the graphic, this uh, dashed line is the historic rate of sea level rise over the past hundred years or so projected out in the future. So if there were no change um, in uh, conditions that would affect sea level rise, and we just projected historic rates into the future, this is what we would look at. But it's pretty well recognized that sea level will rise, uh, principally associated with a, a, warm, a warming climate, uh, a warming oceans, um, and uh, changes in barometric pressure as a result of a variety of atmospheric things that are going on, and that the sea level rise rates will, will increase. Here are, here are two, and I brought, I brought these out because they represent some uh, 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 rates of sea level rise that we're gonna use, uh, we're gonna describe the effects of which uh, on our marshes in, in a moment. Just take one point on that, on this, on this graph, on this orange line. Connecticut, the state of Connecticut has, has adopted uh, a, an upper bound of planning for sea level rise by mid-century, the 2050s, of 20 inches or about 50 centimeters by 2050. So given that standard, we picked this line, which included that data point. And if you were to project it, it's about on this, uh, on this axis, on this side in inches, millimeters on this side, inches on this side, by the end of the century, we would have about 50 inches of sea level rise. Under the highest scenario that was used, we would have about 72 inches or six feet of, of sea level rise. Now, what's interesting is these rates were taken from a New York Academy of Sciences study done for New York Harbor by the state of New York in 2016. It's based on 2010 data. Most recently, uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration has come out with new regionally adjusted sea level rise rates for projected into the future for uh, coastlines across the US, including two points in Connecticut from New London and Groton. If we choose the, uh, the New London tide gauge to determine what NOAA is predicting for future sea level rise, it's predicting 27 inches by mid-century and 76 inches by 2100 using a middle high type of scenario. So NOAA used six different projections. If we choose one that's slightly above the mid point, uh, a medium high kind of projection like we did here, we see that these rates of sea level rise that are currently predicted under this medium high scenario uh, significantly exceed uh, the 20 inches and 50 inches um, that, were, that were used in, in the uh, generation results from the SLAM model, which I'm gonna show you now. Okay, so here's the East River Marsh and two uh, and responses to two different sea level rise scenarios by 2100. Here's the existing marsh. I'm gonna walk you through the, the, um, uh, the legend here. The orange is the high marsh and you can see that much of the East River Marsh is dominated by this high marsh that's infrequently flooded, um, occupied by about three or four different types of grasses and a couple of other plants. Um, that we know has significant benefits uh, to wildlife um, and water quality and carbon sequestration. Um, so a little, little bit of context, Clabbered Road across the East River by right about here. Uh, parts of, of Grass Island uh, do are a little bit lower. They do have some low marsh on it. And the low mar other low marsh is usually just along the creeks. If you see the creeks coming through the marsh, right along the edges of those creeks where that low marsh is, that Spartina ultima floral saltwater cord grass. If we go now, um, and apply the 50 inches or high medium sea level rise to the East River Marsh, we see a dramatic change from it being a, a high marsh dominated system to a low marsh dominated system, a much different plant community uh, that will certainly have ecological implications, um, some of which though we still don't understand. If we look at a high sea level rise scenario of 72 inches, which coincidentally is, is about the medium high projection under the more current NOAA projection for Connecticut shoreline, we see a dramatic change in, in the shoreline, uh, excuse me, in, in, in the marshscape of, of the East River Marsh. It becoming dominated by uh, tidal mudflats um, and uh, low marsh al along the edges. And this is gonna have significant implications for, for some species that, that, that use the high marsh, such as the salt marsh sparrow, which nests there. Um, and if it cannot, uh, if it's flooding more frequently at higher elevations, um, the, that particular species is, is likely not, not, not to do very well. Just, just an example of one possible change. 
So, you know, what does this marsh look, what does it look like on the ground? Just kind of some visual examples. So here's the high marsh dominated system, right along the edges of the creeks and this uh, are the are these low marsh, these low marsh with these tall grasses, but this is kind of a, a typical uh, scene of a, of, of a high marsh. Uh, a low marsh dominated system, which exists throughout the North shore of Long Island, um, in, uh, on the island of Long Island, North shore, they have mostly low marshes, as does our neighbors to the east in Rhode Island. Many of their marshes are low marsh. For some reason, I don't know the reason, for some reason we have what we call a little bit more elevation capital, just kind of a fancy word of saying our marsh platform or surface elevation sits a little bit higher in elevation than the marshes on the North Shore of Long Island or, or in Rhode Island, where they have these low marsh systems, not the same kind of a diversity of plants that you would find in a high marsh system. And then eventually by 2100, if we turn, if these models are correct, uh, worst case scenario would be uh, this type of situation where we have uh, the marsh disappearing, the marsh grass disappearing, being replaced by mud flats and, and, and open water. So now let's take a, a look at this high medium sea level rise scenario, which is kind of about the, the mid-level scenario now under more current projections of sea level rise, what it looks like uh, in 2055 and, and 2100 under this high, medium high sea level rise scenario. So by 2100, we don't have the, the, the mud flats and all the open water. We still have lots of marsh, but it's changed from a, a high marsh dominated system with a little bit more diversity to a low marsh dominated system. And we also see some new marsh popping up in some areas, such as these areas. And, and this is where I really want to focus the attention now is, you know, one of the, some of the low hanging fruit here is just let mother nature do her thing and allow some of these upland areas adjacent to the marsh to flood regularly to create new marsh as a way to replace marsh that we may be losing um, in the future. So for the East River, we've identified about 12 of these larger marsh migration areas. We found, we use kind of as a filter, we wanted to find only those marsh migration areas that were greater than than, uh, than 10 acres and had a high probability of becoming new marsh. I won't describe to you how we define, how we determine this high probability. It was done using a statistical analysis of the model, which was run several hundred times under different sea level rise scenarios to produce areas that were more likely than others to support marsh migration areas. And here we have about a dozen of them. Here's that one uh, that I just showed you along the Amtrak rail line. So what does this look like, this, this marsh migration? So with increasing water levels coming up over the marsh, flooding the uplands, we start to see marsh die back in a variety of ways. We see coastal forests starting to disappear in some of our areas. Um, and this formerly dry upland area now being invaded by this common reed or some of these, uh, some other types of uh, other plants that do well with, um, relatively infrequent flooding of, of marshes. But then as this continues, as these areas become more frequently flooded, we see this kind of iconic uh, high marsh uh, uh, type of vegetation starting to move into the forest, the, the forest being further killed off. We start to see marsh grasses growing in here and here, as well as some of the shrubby plants associated with the marsh border in the transitional areas. And as this continues, um, it would change from, again, from this kind of forest that's disappearing, turning into shrubland, into this, this high, marsh, um, high marsh type of environment. So now, here's what we did. For those 12 marsh migration areas, we're starting to look at them at the parcel scale and trying to identify where they, where they exist and what kind of land cover they have on them and what kind of potential do they have for supporting marsh in the future. Um, here's the Amtrak uh, rail line. Um, uh, uh, Saw Pit Road is kind of over here. Soundview Road's not, not far off. Um, here we see, whoops, uh, here we see some parcels shown in yellow that the, uh, that the SLAM model indicates will become marsh in the future that are currently in private ownership, not protected. And here is a marsh migration area that we recently added to our East River Marsh Wildlife Management Area. So this is kind of the first, uh, first um, one of the first steps. We tried to apply current aerial imagery to make sure that these areas that the model said were appropriate for supporting marsh in the future actually did have the type of land cover um, that could uh, support marsh in the future. Um, and we threw out any of those that the more, that this model said were gonna be marsh migration areas, but because of current land cover type uh, that was missed by the model, um, the, these marsh migration areas probably don't have very good likelihood. So we then took the next step. 
So here again are those, are those areas. And we started collecting imagery to try to figure out what they look like. So here, for example, are uh, three marsh migration area parcels. Here's what they look like from the road. We didn't go on to these properties because uh, they're privately owned, but just pictures we can get from the road. We need to learn more about them as to whether they have a good potential for migrating for the marsh to migrate in the future, much like this one did. This was a real winner. When we saw this, we knew it was very well suited to marsh migration. This is what it looks like. So if you're looking kind of to the west here now, um, you, you be, the camera, when I took this photo, I was looking this way. This little upland island here is this little upland island here. And here's that low, flat, um, dry uplands um, that is already converting to, to, uh, to, to marsh the last time I was out there you know, about, a, about a month ago. So next steps, what do we do? We need to further verify which of these 12 marsh migration areas are gonna have the greatest potential to support marsh migration in the future at that parcel scale. We need to understand you guys who own this property. We need to understand what your concerns are as marsh front property owners. And we wanna know if you'd be interested in working with us to enter an agreements, um, perhaps to restrict future uses of the marsh front of your property to ensure that even after you no longer own it, that there is a restriction on the property through a conservation easement that will ensure it remains undeveloped and able to accommodate the upland migration of the marsh with sea level rise. For those who are unfamiliar with conservation easements, they're, they're voluntary agreements um, between a landowner and, and some kind of conservation organization, whether it be someone like DEP or, or land trust, to restrict, permanently restrict, or limit the use of the land to protect their conservation values. Wherein the, the landowners don't lose all of the rights of ownership. They retain many of them, including, for example, the exclusive right to occupy the property, to sell it, to pass it on to their heirs, to make certain improvements to the property. And it's kind of thought of as a bundle of, of land ownership rights, with one of the rights to build homes, for example. You can extinguish that right, sell it to a conservation organization, and then pass on the rest of your, your retained ownership rights to others to sell the property, um, but not with the right uh, to further develop the property for the area that's subject to the conservation restriction. So that's where we come to wanting to know more about your interest in this. And what other questions or concerns do you have about this concept of conservation easements and restrictions? If you're on the call and you own property adjacent to a marsh, um, perhaps you own part of the marsh, perhaps you own the upland, if I were to come to you and say, would you be interested in restricting the uses of your property along the marsh that are an upland area that could be marshed in the future? What would your, what would your reaction be? What would, what would be some of your concerns? What would be some of your questions? Is, is there anyone who's willing to, to share maybe some of their concerns or questions, or maybe just misunderstandings of what a conservation easement is? Um, David, uh, someone on the call named Walter had a, had a question. Um, so Walter, if you wanted to ask that question now or respond to David's question. Oh, you're muted. Sorry. And David, we do have some folks writing into the chat as well. Okay. He looks to unmute himself. Okay. There we go. Walter, go ahead. Yeah. So my question, I think David is, is on a new topic, which is really what would landowners like to do. I was really talking more about which trying to get in before we were talking about places that were um, we've seen change. And yeah, what I look at a lot is Spence Creek, which floods quite yeah. a bit, and it's it's quite a com it's complex to us who don't follow this closely. Who really has jurisdiction over the wetlands? Is it the tidal wetlands, is it, you know, or is it the is it the town? All of that is something maybe not for this discussion. You can bring that up later. No, I think it's a very relevant uh, question. Um, yes, the the state of Connecticut has a coastal permitting program called the Tidal Wetlands Permitting Program, and its jurisdiction is over tidal wetlands rather than inland or, or, or non-tidal wetlands. So if you were to propose an activity that is in a wetland that's subject to the ebb and flood of the tide, and, and we determine that it's a tidal wetland based upon it being subject to tidal inundation and containing some plants that indicate it's a tidal wetland, then the state of Connecticut 
would be the permitting authority you would need to come to in order to perform that activity in the wetland. If it is a non-tidal wetland, you have your own Inland Wetlands and Water Courses Commission, um, and they would have the sole authority to review applications for activities in, in these non-tidal or inland wetlands. So we'll just take one follow-up. So if the land isn't tidal or inland, it's just, you know, we're, you're concerned about uh, allowing migration. That's really left up to the, uh, the property owner voluntarily allowing yes. for migration at this yeah. point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, yes, it is. Or if there's a proposal to add, to build or to bring soil on that will still come back to maybe not tight, come back to, I guess, zoning is where it lands. Yes, you are likely need, you need to get a, a zoning a, a approval for it. If, yeah. if it was not and an inland wetland, they're... not a tidal wetland, but was in one of these marsh migration areas that we're projecting could be wetlands in the future, but currently are hot, are, are dry and don't have the plants that support tidal wetlands currently, you would you would go to your, your, your uh, zoning commission for approvals. Yeah, and I guess the question for us as who live in the different towns is how to get our zoning commissions to think more about uh, sea level rise. And it's partly education and partly, I guess, not changing regulation, but more education. Yeah, no, and it could be about changing regulations as well. Some towns have are called non-infringement areas that are within 100 feet of a tidal wetland. Uh, I know, for example, for the town of Stonington at one point, I don't know if they still have it, but they did not allow any activity, any earth disturbance within 100 feet of a tidal wetland. And that and that's a, a great way to, to, to protect a, a, a tidal, a, Tidal marsh, marsh migration areas, um, but other communities don't, don't have that, um, and there's all kinds of flavors in, in between. Um, so it really depends upon your community, and uh, I think it would be a great idea if you encourage your zoning commission to examine how it regulates these areas uh, that are within a certain distance of, of, a, of a tidal marsh. Thank you. Do you have a good question? You know, the questions about what a conservation easement is, what it does, what you're, what you're left with, how it works. Dave, there is a question in the chat um, that says, are there any tax credits or write-offs that are in place or could be considered um, in the conservation easement program, kind of like property tax rejections? That was by Sharon B. Yes, and, and you should um, consult with your, your tax professional to get an answer on that because it really depends upon uh, uh, on your unique uh, in income tax situation. But yes, there are tax benefits. If you were to donate, for example, a conservation easement or sell it to a conservation organization at a value less than it is appraised at. So what we would do if we were working with a landowner and this became a matter, we would ask the landowner or we would, we would get an appraisal of the property, what it's worth currently and what it's worth with the conservation restriction. Let's say you have a two acre or let's say you have a 10 acre property, two acres are, are, are um, marsh migration area. And we were interested in placing a conservation easement on those, uh, on those two acres. And let's say you were allowed to build something on, on, on those two acres, maybe not another house, but perhaps uh, a pool, uh, a shed, um, some, other type of type, some other type of structure. If the conservation easement then restricted or prohibited the construction, those construct, coast construction activities on those two acres, then the appraiser would determine what the value of the property is without your ability to construct on those two acres. And the difference between those two appraisals would be the value of the conservation easement. And if you were to sell that conservation easement for less than the value that appraiser assigns to it, then you could potentially use that difference um, for tax benefits. But again, exactly what the tax benefit is um, depends upon your tax situation. You would have to work with your accountant or tax lawyer to determine the extent of that benefit. Any other questions about easements? There was one question in the chat from Anne who said, uh, we live on the Eastern edge Neck River. How can we find out if portions of our two plus acres would be appropriate for an easement? That is a good question. We would have to come out and, and look at, at, at the property. But right now we are focusing on the, uh, on the East River. We do have funding to help acquire conservation easements, uh, but currently we're looking at the, at the, at the East River. 
Um, but you, if you had questions such as that, someone from my agency could come out and help you generally define um, the area of tidal marsh on your property. And I actually have a, a, a program results from the SLAM analysis where I could actually look to see what the computer generated uh, projection is for marsh migration on, on your property. So we do have data sources available uh, to do that. Uh, but right now we're, we're reserving our funds to help uh, conserve the marshes along the East River, East River Marsh. There are no others. I'm going to continue on, but there will be an opportunity one more time for, for questions. So uh, what we're trying to do uh, to kind of sum things up here is making sure that if there are areas of tidal marsh that are adjacent to undeveloped uplands that are suitable and capable of moving outside the existing boundary of, of the marsh to dry uplands, that we want to make sure that those areas will remain available for that upland migration of, of, of the marsh. Um, and what we need to do next is to try to better identify where those best opportunities are. We plan on going out and doing more field visits and trying to collect more imagery uh, to kind of triage those properties that we think have the greatest value. And we want to hear from, we want to contact those landowners as to if you have one of those properties, would you be interested in talking with us about the future management of your property to accommodate marsh migration? And more generally, do you have other technical assistance questions about concerns about more frequent flooding of your property? And are there less destructive ways to try to, for example, manage coastal erosion without putting hard structures like the riprap rock that was shown in, in an earlier photograph. There are ways to try to minimize coastal erosion without uh, modifying the landscape such that the marsh will not, would, would be able to migrate in the future if it was, if it was done in, in, in the right way. So that's kind of our, 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 next, our next steps. We have a variety of um, information to give you that will further describe, for example, we have a, a great East River Marsh video, maybe some of you have seen it, we have an East River, uh, East River Marsh fact sheet. We also have uh, a little mini report, about six or eight pages that goes into a little more detail about why the East River Marsh is important, what some of the challenges are, and how we might respond to some of those challenges. Uh, what are some of the uh, marsh restoration projects we're thinking about in the marsh? Um, there is a model you can go to uh, called the Sea Level Affecting Marshes Model. It's on this website at the Connecticut Environmental Conditions Online website at UConn. But that model only shows you the results of marsh change for 21 of the largest marshes in Connecticut. That is those marshes over about 95 to 100 acres. So the smaller marshes uh, in Connecticut would not be displayed here. But I do have a computer program that shows results for all marshes. So if you're particularly interested in your property on a marsh that's not included within the results reported here for these 21 largest marshes, we can get that to you. Connecticut Sea Grant has done a nice job putting together a coastal planting guide of how you might want to manage your marsh front using plantings to control erosion. They also have an experiment going on underway in the town of Stonington where they're preparing a test plot that's a marsh migration area and they've changed the vegetation to kind of jumpstart the marsh migration process. Um, there's a, a blog and a, and, a, and a website that describes that project. And then also the University of Connecticut also did a, a, a survey of marsh front property owners and it asked them the kind of questions I'm asking you and what your response would be. It's kind of an academic paper, a, a little bit dense, um, but if you're willing to wade through it as a marsh front landowner, some of the things might resonate with you because it was, they went into great detail as just asking folks why they, what some of their concerns are about um, moving forward with the uh, plans or restrictions on, on your property and who you'd want to talk to if you were considering uh, perhaps donating or selling a conservation easement. So there's all kinds of resources out there. Um, we will be able, you'll be able to use this recording um, or we can provide, we have your email address if you signed up for this. Um, you can email us and ask, I can, we can send you basically this, this list of, of resources uh, if you wanted to look at it uh, on, on a single page. So 
Any other questions that we haven't gone over? I, I've kept you quite a bit. I uh, appreciate your kind attention. We have some contact information for me here and for my colleague, Luke, uh, at, at uh, Audubon, Connecticut. If you have questions for us that you don't want to raise here, you want to talk one-on-one, -on -one, we, we'd be willing to do that. Um, I have some additional questions for you uh, to wrap up the evening, but I, at this point, is there anything else that we on your mind that we didn't we didn't discuss, or perhaps I didn't wasn't clear enough in explaining? Uh, David, the only thing that I would like to add is uh, that uh, the Nantucket Audubon Society is doing the marsh migration studies, uh, which are line transect studies, which right now are being done at the uh, at the at the salt meadow. Uh, Guilford uh, Salt Meadow Sanctuary. And uh, the purpose of these studies is to ground truth uh, what is shown in the, uh, in the SLAM model uh, projections. Uh, and this is a project that is, uh, has uh, two, uh, two, uh, two days, um, uh, one in the spring and one in the fall when we're out there um, of, uh, uh, analyzing uh, the plants and the animals and so forth. And this is uh, an ongoing project for the next 80 years, we hope. Thank you. Some part, last parting questions, just to kind of jog your memory uh, of things you might want to ask if you haven't already. I'd kind of like to know, you Marshford property owners are right on the front line of, of, of flooding and, and coastal erosion. Um, and, I, and I'm curious, if you haven't already discussed them, you know, what are some of your concerns about living on, on a marsh? Um, is your mar are you seeing any marsh erosion? Are, are you seeing uh, more frequent flooding of your uplands? Um, do you notice any changes in the types of plants that are growing perhaps in your backyard uh, with the uh, more frequent flooding of, of salt water? And if you have questions, what are those types of technical assistance do you, do you need from us? Um, we do have folks in our office who are experts in um, tidal marsh, um, and we do know folks who have experimented with different types of coastal erosion techniques uh, that are more beneficial for the marsh than, uh, than hard structures. Anything else you guys uh, want to talk about before we call it a night? David, I'd just like to add that uh, Sharon put the, uh, the links in the chat, and if anybody wants to save the chat, open it in the lower right corner of the chat is our three dots. Click on those three dots and you can save the chat. It goes into a text file in a folder called Zoom. Yeah. And if for some reason that doesn't work out, you have my email address, david.kozak at ct.gov and, and Luke's address send us an email and we'll send you a copy of that, of that page. Well, with that, you've been a very fine, engaged audience. I've enjoyed, I've enjoyed uh, virtually meeting you and perhaps one day I will meet you out on, on the East River Marsh. And with that, I think I'm gonna call it a night unless anyone else has anything to say. Thank you, David, for an excellent presentation. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you very much. Thanks, David. Good night. Talk to you later. Thank you, David. Great presentation. Appreciate Bye -bye. it. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank you for attending. Nice job, Dave. Good night, Corey. Good night.